2 billion years ago. The very first eukaryotes are known in the fossil record now that the cyanobacteria had been adding oxygen to the atmosphere. And from these early eukaryotes, a large number of eukaryotic lineages diverge. And given that they have had 2 billion years to evolve prior to the present, there are great variations uh, among them in their lifestyle, uh, the form of sexual reproduction that they perform, uh, because sexual reproduction was present in early eukaryotes, but it varies greatly throughout different eukaryotic groups. Now, most of these groups we refer to as protists, but from these uh, protus. Uh, there were three lineages uh, which are entirely multicellular in the animals or the plants, were primarily uh, multicellular in uh, the fungi. And so fungi are eukaryotes and one of three groups which while they are descended from uh, protus, um, just because of you know their success and their multicellularity, uh, we refer to them as a separate kingdom. Now, uh, fungi, uh, as you notice, were closely related uh, to animals, um, and there are things that they share, even, you know, uh, collagen, which is the major protein of animals, is known uh, in fungi, for example. Um, and so while fungi and animals are different, uh, perhaps, you know, we could compare uh, them, you know, perhaps to uh, understand uh, fungi a bit uh, better. So both are heterotrophs. They do not uh, perform uh, photosynthesis. They do not get energy from um, uh, the sun. So thus they must uh, obtain say sugars, proteins, lipids, etc., from other organisms. Now animals uh, typically eat those other organisms. Here a spider is eating a dragonfly or a deer is eating uh, plants. Um, but fungi, instead of getting um, uh, these other organisms inside their bodies into, say, a stomach and digesting them inside the stomach. Fungi secrete their digestive enzymes into the environment and then absorb the biomolecules which are broken down. So, you know, in, in a sense, the world is the stomach of the fungi. They secrete their enzymes into it um, and then absorb uh, the nutrients, but they are heterotrophs just as animals are. Um, uh, Animals are mobile, so they can move, say, towards their prey. Um, fungi are not mobile, and so therefore their microscopic strands, known as hyphae, have to grow into the substrate. So animals move uh, towards something, fungi grow into something. Um, these hyphae form uh, a um, mass known as a, a mycelium, um, which is different from the differentiated organs that animals um, uh, will uh, form. Um, and fungi are primarily haploid uh, while animals are uh, diploid. Now, because of that, uh, these terms will come up uh, frequently, I'm going to uh, just define them uh, in a second if, uh, you know, a, a student would benefit from repeating the definition. Um, animal cells do not have a cell wall, um, but uh, fungi cells, uh, fungal cells, have a cell wall made of chitin. Um, so chitin is also known in arthropods, once again, uh, something that they share. Uh, so uh, just a quick definition on uh, the types of cells. So uh, because it will come up, uh, the words haploid and diploid refer to the number of chromosomes which are present in a cell. Um, because in sexually reproducing organisms, part of uh, the life cycle uh, exists where cells are haploid, where they have one copy of each chromosome. And some uh, stages of the life cycle are diploid, where there are two copies of each cell of, the, uh, of each chromosome. Now, in animals like humans, the diploid phase is multicellular. So it's our you know, cheek cells, our muscle cells, our bone cells, which have two copies of each chromosome. And the haploid phase is unicellular, where uh, only sperm and ova have one copy of each chromosome. But that does not have to be the case. And so multicellular organisms could be composed of haploid cells. So haploid reproductive cells can grow up to be haploid multicellular organisms, as we will see uh, in uh, fungi as uh, we get to that uh, later. So uh, fungi 
once again, I do not have differentiated tissues and organs. Uh, the uh, spores uh, germinate into microscopic strands, which are known as hyphae, which then grow into you know, whatever material uh, the, the fungus is uh, occupying and attempting to digest, et cetera. So here you see microscopic strands known as hyphae. And uh, when you have a mass of uh, these, um, uh, these are known as a mycelia. Um, and so because of this, it's hard to study fungi because microscopic strands are difficult to obtain. So when you walk in soil, when you look at the bottom of the ocean, there are hyphae there uh, forming uh, these masses known uh, as uh, mycelia. And um, sometimes, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, one of the things that makes some uh, hyphae different from others is in some hyphae, uh, the cell walls completely enclose uh, uh, the cells forming septa. In some uh, hyphae, there are pores uh, in uh, the septa uh, so that you know, materials and cell organelles can flow back and forth. And in some uh, uh, species, um, there are no septa, and so therefore, um, there can more or less be a current of cellular materials, you know, taking the nuclei and organelles and other nutrients. So nutrients could, you know, uh, be absorbed over here and then flow directly uh, into other parts of the uh, mycelium. And so uh, when we consider fungi, we often don't have a good appreciation of where, quote, the body begins and ends in an animal, you can see that. But if these are microscopic strands, they can stretch out farther than you know. Um, and it is known that fungi represent some of the largest organisms on uh, the planet. Um, because if you said, oh, I see, for example, some mushrooms over here, some mushrooms over here, I go an acre away or uh, a mile away, you know, and I find uh, some mushrooms over there. These are all separate, mu uh, separate individuals. Well, the reality is the mushroom is not the main part of the fungus. It is the reproductive structure, as we will get to. And so this is most likely one single fungus. It's not like there's, you know, if this were a plant, you'd say, oh, there's one plant, two plants, three plants. But this is probably one simple, uh, single fungus with a mass of mycelia in uh, the soil from which occasional reproductive uh, structures uh, arise. Um, and so you can actually, you know, find fungi over here and then go acres away and then find fungi over there and assume they are different. Um, but the reality is that in the soil between, it could be the same fungus. And so um, there uh, are just examples known where uh, fungi cover incredible area and thus represent um, the largest organisms on um, uh, on uh, the planet. Uh, and, but once again, uh, difficult uh, to study uh, these, uh, uh, these fungi given this uh, mass uh, known as the mycelium and the, hyper, uh, the microscopic strands. Now, what, the hardest thing to understand with fungi is spores. Um, because using a term like spore, one would assume that there's a good definition of uh, of a spore, and that spores mean one single uh, thing. Uh, the difficulty is, and perhaps you'll appreciate this a little bit better by the end of this, spores, it, the word is just a grab bag uh, term. Um, and the reason it cannot be defined um, you know, very accurately is one, because there's all of these different groups of fungi. Fungi represent a kingdom with different phyla and the reproduction in uh, different phyla of uh, fungi varies. And some of these spores are resulting uh, from asexual structures. So if you have a mycelium, that's just one strain, one individual, it could produce a sporangium, which makes uh, spores. Uh, now this would be asexual because it hasn't encountered another individual. And these are just for propagation. It wasn't sexual reproduction. Um, but then obviously there could be different uh, strains of individual. And when two different strains meet, they could reproduce sexually. Um, 
And so some spores could be sexual. And so there are different kinds of fungal uh, spores. There are asexual uh, uh, spores, uh, there are sexual um, uh, spores, um, and because there are um, different types of fungi, uh, then uh, which reproduce uh, sexually in different ways, uh, then this can vary from group uh, uh, to group. And so we can talk about zygospores and the zygomycetes or the uh, ascospores and the ascomycetes, et cetera. Um, some fungi may have a haploid phase and a diploid phase, both of which may uh, produce spores. And so even one fungus could produce multiple types of uh, spores. And so they're difficult to say. So this grab bag, you know, uh, a term includes a lot of um, different types of structures, asexual, sexual, in different types of groups. But they're important uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, um, we breathe them in a lot, and they can promote in inflammation. And the chronic inflammation of the lungs can lead to asthma and other uh, problems. So there are health consequences to fungal. As spores, so we certainly want to study them. Now, I just have here that because you know fungi have these microscopic strands known as hyphae, um, and uh, very often the only way to really identify uh, them is to like do uh, DNA fingerprints and study them uh, genetically. Um, as I'll get to uh, later, uh, there's so much that we don't understand about fungi. So, for example, spores grow, uh, blow into the ocean because they're in the wind. They end up in the ocean uh, sediment and hyphae then germinate. But what does that mean? Does that mean this is kind of an accident? So this fungus is primarily terrestrial and just, you know, it accidentally end up, ended up in the ocean and it's just hanging from there? Or is marine sediment really one of the habitats where this fungus spreads? So what fungi are in the ocean and what are they doing there? Well, because they're microscopic strains, they're very hard to study. Uh, and so, um, uh, so there, there's a lot that we don't know. Um, but fungi are interesting in and of themselves, um, but they are certainly important to understand um, because they exist in ecosystems and therefore have a large number of relationships uh, with both animals and plants. Uh, a lot of fungi are decomposers. They are saprobes. Um, their hyphae grow into dead organisms and they digest the dead organisms. Now, once again, they're just secreting enzymes in the environment, they break this down. Um, now, while this benefits the fungus, it also liberates uh, the molecules which were in the body of this dead fish. You know, these nutrients are no longer doing the dead fish uh, any benefit. And that then makes these nutrients now available for bacteria, for protists, for plant roots, and you know this uh, then uh, helps to recycle uh, nutrients. And so uh, the decomposing uh, bacteria, they have a great uh, value uh, there. However, once fungi can digest animal tissue as they can, um, obviously it's not that far a leap to digest animal tissue um, in organisms which are still alive, and thus they can cause disease. So athlete's foot, for example, is caused uh, by um, uh, fungus. Uh, there are some serious fungal diseases in animals, such as the white nose uh, syndrome, which has caused the death of millions of North American bats and costing insect control billions of dollars. Bats can eat their weight in mosquitoes every night. And when you lose millions of bats uh, to uh, this disease, obviously there's a, a serious uh, impact uh, in uh, insect uh, population. The problem uh, with uh, bats is when they hibernate, um, they often uh, then do so in mass. Uh, so lots of individuals, even individuals from different species, all huddle together, and that's an easy place for the fungus to spread. There is another type of fungus, an aquatic fungus called a chytrid, um, which uh, can cause lethal infections in species of frogs so severe that uh, some frog species are declining and it's thought that this is even uh, uh, potentially causing species extinction, the severity of this fungal uh, infection. 
In humans, once again, things like athlete's foot, uh, you know, a threshold by a yeast infection uh, aren't as serious, but asthma certainly is. Um, and so asthma is, can be life-threatening and fungal spores uh, can uh, trigger the chronic inflammation, which is behind uh, asthma. And so um, uh, they can have uh, effects there. Um, some fungi are what are called facultative uh, parasites in that their primary mode of existence is to you know, um, uh, decompose dead things. But given the opportunity, I mean, the fungus doesn't know, it's just secreting enzymes and absorbing nutrients, the difference between dead and living tissue. Um, and if say an individual was immunocompromised or very sick, a fungus might take hold that otherwise uh, would not uh, have. Um, uh, and uh, there are different uh, groups of uh, fungi and some have unique uh, relationships with animals. So for example, uh, the ruminants are able to digest cellulose. Um, but one of the reasons that they can is because um, of a, a group of uh, fungi which inhabit their, uh, their intestines. Uh, and so fungi can have uh, diverse uh, relationships uh, with, uh, uh, with animals. And as I'll see, as I'll show you presently, some fungi are actually predators which can eat microscopic animals like nematode worms. In the same way, uh, fungi can have diverse relationships with plants. While fungi do not typically cause serious uh, diseases in um, animals, they do frequently cause serious diseases in uh, plants um, for the same reason um, that uh, many fungi are decomposers. They are saprobes, which I can digest dead wood, dead leaves, and recycle the nutrients. And as such, then they serve a great role in uh, ecosystems in recycling uh, these nutrients. However, once again, it's not that far a leap to go from digesting dead plant material to digesting living plant material and thus causing disease. And so there are um, things like molds and mildews and smuts and rusts, which are fungi, uh, which are uh, causing uh, diseases in, um, in uh, living uh, plant uh, uh, cells. Uh, so once again, uh, and, and some uh, fungi are capable of doing both. They are facultative. Uh, so uh, they are opportunistic in that sense. So if they had the chance to digest dead material, they would. If they had a chance uh, to uh, digest living material, they would. And so, and sometimes, once again, just like humans or uh, animals could be weakened or uh, immunocompromised, so too can plants uh, have uh, that condition. So for example, if it's been a drought, if there's acid rain, um, the plant is stressed and then stressed plants might, might be more vulnerable to infection. Um, but not all of the interactions are bad. Obviously, decomposing uh, fungi help to recycle nutrients, which can then be absorbed by plant roots and benefit other plants. As I'll mention later, fungi and algae. Uh, algae can um, form uh, lichens in a symbiotic uh, relationship. So here's a relationship where both uh, are benefiting. I'll get uh, to that again in a uh, uh, a little bit. Um, and then, uh, as I'll pursue a little more deeply in a second, uh, the, uh, the majority of plants have uh, a cooperation with fungi in their root systems, forming what are known as mycorrhizae. And so when you look at this, you say, oh, here's a plant root. Here are plant cells in the plant root. Well, actually, this could be fungi. Uh, associated with the plant root that might actually make up a third of the weight of what you think is the plant um, uh, uh, root. And I'll get to the fossils of this uh, in uh, a second. Um, and so there are diverse uh, relationships uh, that fungi can have with plants. And once again, uh, they are uh, the major group of plant parasites. Uh, so in humans and, and animals, they can cause disease, but they are typically not the major causes of disease. Uh, but in plants, that is not the case. So if here you look at, um, uh, here are plant cells, and here are the cells of mildew digesting the living 
uh, plant cells. There are different types of uh, mildews which can affect uh, different uh, species of uh, plants. Uh, there are other uh, fungi which are known as uh, rusts. So here you can see the fungus of the white pine blister rust and then the plant cells were beneath it. Here you notice them making all of these spores, but obviously the fungi are digesting uh, the plant. And here's what's known as a smut. This is the fungus inside and uh, the plant um, uh, that tissue. Um, in the diverse relationships uh, that uh, fungi can have, some fungi are uh, predators and they're uh, hyphae um, actually uh, makes these little loops uh, which attempt to trap microscopic worms known as nematodes. The nematodes then uh, get uh, trapped uh, here and then the hyphae uh, gradually grow into uh, the, uh, uh, the nematode. So here are the nematode uh, worms. And here you can see that one is trapped and you can even, even see that this is tethering it. So it swam through a lasso more or less and now it is uh, trapped. It will not uh, be able to move from this spot. And now the fungus will continue to grow more uh, hyphae, uh, which then will uh, then grow into uh, this um, a worm and gradually then uh, digest. Uh, so once again, the video that I'm making, and here you can see uh, the uh, nematode is below, uh, but it, this is almost like a forest. You know, when you look at a microscope slide, you forget that it's three-dimensional. And so there are these upright stalks which are making spores, and that's what you saw a second ago, the uh, sporangia making uh, spores, but now going back to the bottom layer. Here's where the nematode worms uh, are trapped. And here you can see later uh, that they, you know, have been digested. And so here, you know, once again, a lot of the, uh, the hyphae are growing uh, vertically. You can see that, but here they've digested uh, these worms. So some uh, fungi are actually the predators of, uh, of animals. Okay. Uh, this next video is actually of a slime mold. So it's a protist, not a fungus. But in the slime mold, you can see the cytoplasmic straining because the cells, after they undergo mitosis uh, and produce new nuclei, they don't do then cytokinesis, which splits the nuclei into separate compartments. So the stuff of the slime mold can then just kind of go back and forth. And so uh, some fungi uh, do that as uh, uh, well. They are coincidic. Um, and so that's uh, just, uh, once again, even though it's not a fungus, it's a, a video. Uh, which gives you an idea of what uh, can go on uh, inside uh, a fungus. Because uh, the body of a fungus is composed of these microscopic strands known as hyphae, um, studying them in the fossil record is difficult um, because spores are so common. Um, but once again, a spore is just more or less a round structure. Fossils of spores could easily be confused or other, you know, uh, reproductive st uh, structure from protists. So studying uh, the fossils of fungi is uh, difficult. Uh, it is thought uh, that uh, uh, fungi um, uh, go back at least a billion years, uh, and there are fossils uh, which seem to be uh, uh, fungal. Um, and now these would originate in marine environments, but there are marine uh, fungi, uh, and so. Um, if we look at the history of life uh, here in the green section, um, this is when the protists uh, first uh, appeared and it would be sometime uh, later uh, that uh, fossils of fungi uh, would be known in uh, marine uh, environments. Um, so once again, there are marine fungi uh, today and it is uh, thought that they were uh, among the uh, earliest uh, fossils. Um, in the, uh, in, uh, of the eukaryotic uh, kingdoms in uh, the ocean. Now, uh, when life made it onto land, um, fungi were among the earliest uh, colonizers of land before the animals made it. Um, and the earliest plants, um, many have uh, uh, evidence of uh, fox, uh, uh, fossil uh, fungal extensions known as mycorrhizae. So just like modern plants 
benefit from an association with fungi in their plant uh, roots. It seems that this was actually, you know, something that the first plants had. And so fungi might have been crucial in helping plants adapt uh, to land and helping the first uh, land, uh, plants adapt uh, to uh, terrestrial um, environments. Interestingly, uh, uh, as we get uh, into um, the Silurian and the early Devonian, um, there are these uh, structures which were uh, originally named prototaxites, which that's the Latin word for you. It was thought that it was a yew tree, um, but actually it seems to be, you know, a fungus, kind of like a giant mushroom, which could maybe be 20 feet tall. And because there were no trees yet at, at this point, uh, for a while in the fossil record, um, there is evidence that fungi were uh, the uh, largest uh, structures uh, on Earth. So once again, uh, although it is difficult to get fossils uh, of uh, fungi, uh, given the microscopic strands, um, there are fossils uh, in marine environments which are thought to be uh, fungal, uh, indicating that they are uh, quite old. Um, and there are fossils on land uh, indicating that uh, mycorrhizal uh, fungi helped the earliest plants uh, to adapt to terrestrial environments, and that some actually became, uh, you know, a giant. Now, in addition to these mic microscopic strands, it should be stressed that there are actually unicellular fungi as well, the yeasts. And there are different types of yeasts. They're not all closely uh, related. And so um, it seems that unicellular uh, fungi then adapted to multicellularity, and there are still uh, unicellular uh, fungi, the yeasts alive today. So they exist as a single cell that reproduce by budding. So a smaller cell comes off of a larger cell and then that can then grow to full size and then continue to bud. And yeasts are um, incredibly important. Now, while they can cause uh, uh, mild uh, infections, uh, which can uh, be treated. Their economic value is that they can uh, produce things like alcohol. Now they don't always produce alcohol and they don't make alcohol in an aerobic environment. If there's oxygen uh, available, um, then they will break sugar down into carbon dioxide and water just as we do. But if there's little uh, oxygen available, then instead of forming carbon dioxide, they form ethyl alcohol. Um, and so uh, obviously this is important in, you know, alcoholic uh, beverages. And so one adds yeast to grapes to make uh, wine, and one can add yeast to lots of uh, things like you know, sugarcane or wheat or uh, potatoes, uh, etc., and then thus make an alcoholic beverage from any plant material that has sugar uh, in it. Um, and, uh, one can also then use it uh, for rising bread because the alcohol is produced with carbon dioxide. Um, and in rising bread, the ethanol is baked off in the heat of uh, the oven, but the carbon dioxide is what makes a uh, bread rise. And so uh, when we're dealing with fungi, because fungi include yeast, when one considers the economic importance of bread and alcoholic beverages, uh, you know, these fungi are incredibly um, important. Uh, to uh, uh, to humans uh, and you know their uh, economies. Uh, once again, there is a group of uh, fungi uh, which actually live in aquatic environments, both freshwater uh, and a marine, known as chytrids, and they do make flagellated gametes. So here, you know, among all of this, there there are fungi. Uh, we just you know often then don't study them and their spores could then be uh, swimming uh, uh, throughout uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, material. Remember that there's a major aquatic fungus, which uh, is a pathogen uh, on uh, frogs. Um, now, uh, I'm gonna start uh, emphasizing uh, uh, fungal uh, life cycles uh, a bit uh, more, and this is where you know, it gets uh, a bit complicated. Um, because uh, fungi have both haploid and diploid uh, phases. Uh, and so um, uh, the chytrids, for example, you could have haploid, remember haploid meaning 
having one copy of each chromosome, haploid hyphae releasing haploid um, uh, spores, which are flagellated and can swim. Um, these can then uh, reproduce uh, and form, um, once again, more uh, haploid uh, uh, strands, which can form what are called gametangia, which are releasing flagellated cells, but different kinds. Now, we don't like to use male and female um, all uh, the time, so some people would prefer plus and minus strains, um, but either way, these opposite uh, then uh, uh, strains could then fuse and now form a diploid cell, which could then germinate to make a diploid uh, hypha, um, and then a diploid mass of hyphae known as a mycelium. Um, then inside these diploid uh, cells, you can then have a meiosis occur to produce haploid uh, cells, and then the cycle will uh, begin uh, again. Uh, and so um, one of the things we don't understand well about fungi is to what degree uh, they are in uh, the ocean. Um, we certainly know that spores are in the ocean, that hyphae are in the ocean, um, and since some of the, these uh, also then live on land, it's hard to say whether they're actually thriving in the ocean or whether it was kind of an accidental arrival of uh, spores uh, that you know, are just opportunistic uh, uh, there. Um, but it certainly seems that fungi are important decomposers in ocean sediments, uh, but we don't really understand the degree to which uh, they do. So once again, one of the uh, relationships that uh, fungi have with plants is to form these extensions of roots. So here in pink, um, that's not the plant root. The plant root is here, um, but this is then uh, hyphae from the fungus known as mycorrhizae. The plant likes this, and so the plant will uh, supply uh, the fungus with sugar and nutrients, and the plant is doing photosynthesis, so it has sugar to spare, but the plant needs water and nutrients. But these hyphae are stretching beyond the true plant roots, so they can absorb water, absorb nutrients, and then bring it to the plant root. So the uh, hyphae are bringing uh, what the plant needs, and then the plant then supplies the fungus with food. So this is a symbiosis. Some mycorrhizae like these are known as ectomycorrhizae um, because they are uh, not growing within the plant cells. So they're kind of on the outside of uh, the plant um, uh, cells. Uh, and there are different types of fungi which uh, could do that, but the group called the Basidiomycetes, they're the major ones. However, there are also these arbuscular uh, mycorrhizae or AM fungi. Um, they can actually grow within plant cells. Uh, and so the uh, fungal hyphae actually penetrate the plant root, actually penetrate the plant cells in order to form this uh, association. Um, about three quarters of terrestrial plants form associations with, uh, with fungal uh, mycorrhizae for their roots, uh, so much so that a third of what we think is a plant root might actually be the fungi associated with the plant uh, root. Um, and as such, uh, here uh, you can see these AM fungi growing um, in, uh, inside uh, the, uh, uh, the cells. Um, uh, while many plants benefit uh, from uh, these, uh, some plants actually require these. So, for example, if one were trying to grow orchids, unless you had the, uh, uh, the fungi which could form the mycorrhizae, um, then you might not be able to, to get the uh, orchids uh, to survive. So there are different groups of fungi and they have different um, life cycles. Let me just quickly hit a couple. So there's a group of fungi known as the zygomycetes, and bread mold would be a common example of this. And their life cycle would be that you would have different strains, which would form haploid uh, hyphae, um, and then thus massive known as mycelia, growing, say, throughout uh, old uh, bread. Uh, they would then produce these upright uh, sporangia fours, which would produce a sporangia, which then produce these haploid spores, which are asexual and this would then just propagate themselves. But because there are two different strands here, it is possible that hyphae 
from two different strands would then meet, all right, and then form, and I'm sorry, we'll see uh, a yellow spore at the bottom there, uh, a zygospore, uh, which is the sexual phase. And then inside the zygospore, um, then uh, you would then have meiosis produce haploid uh, spores, uh, which would then uh, repeat uh, the life cycle. So this is one group of fungi. Once again, bread mold is a common example of that. The majority of fungi actually uh, belong to a group known as the ascomycota or the ascomycetes. Um, and they produce a cup-like uh, structure uh, in which um, meiosis occurs. This would include uh, the yeasts. So yeasts are obviously important. It includes uh, mildews. Uh, these are ascomycetes. Um, and so here you'll see an ascus. So that's cup-like structure, which is uh, forming the, uh, which surrounds the spores. That's known as the ascus. And the ascospores are then developing uh, within uh, uh, that ascus. So here, if we look at this one under the microscope, once again, we see a, uh, a cup-like uh, structure uh, with ascospores. Um, and so um, and while there are uh, some uh, mushrooms, uh, which one would recognize, uh, a lot of uh, these, while ascomycetes are the, uh, the most uh, diverse group of fungi, uh, you know, they make up lots of mildews, they include the yeast, uh, they include most of the fungi which form lichens, and uh, they aren't uh, the large uh, visible uh, uh, the visible mushrooms, uh, that is another uh, group known as the basidiomycetes. Uh, and so we'll see that uh, group uh, next. So uh, here's just a, a quick review of the life cycle of basidiomycetes. Once again, you have haploid spores, uh, which uh, will grow into uh, haploid um, mycelia. Um, and once again, there can be uh, different uh, strains uh, here. So these are haploid. Um, but when opposite strains uh, meet from these primary mycelia, they do something which is uh, uh, unique. Um, uh, these cells, which have one nucleus per cell, and we could use the term monokaryotic uh, for that state, they then fuse. Um, and now two nuclei are in one cell, but instead of you know, fusing the way, say, a sperm and ova, then form one diploid nucleus. Here you have two haploid nuclei living in one single cell. It's what's called the dikaryotic condition, with two separate haploid nuclei existing in one cell that then forms a secondary mycelium. And this can then mature into a mushroom. So a mushroom is not the fungus. It is the reproductive structure resulting from the secondary uh, mycelium of this uh, fungus. Here we have dikaryotic cells uh, which form this structure and then in the um, uh, inside the gills of the uh, mushroom then meiosis occurs uh, to produce haploid uh, uh, spores and then the cycle will begin again. So when we look inside uh, mushrooms uh, what is happening is this is where those uh, dikaryon uh, cells and then undergo meiosis to produce haploid uh, spores and then the upright nature of the mushroom exists so that it can help to spread uh, those uh, spores. So sexual reproduction evolved early in the history of uh, eukaryotes, um, but just like many protists have then modified it. So there are you know, differences uh, in sexual reproduction from uh, group from one group of protists to the next. The same thing applies to, mushroom, uh, to fungi. The majority of fungi are, do have a sexual part of their life cycle, um, but it varies from one group of fungi to the next. Um, then finally, uh, once again, there are many different uh, symbioses and relationships that fungi can have with organisms. Um, lichens are organisms which have both um, uh, algae or cyanobacteria, and then uh, a fungus. Uh, the fungus is kind of anchoring the structure, providing protection, and the hyphae absorb water and nutrients, um, but the algae or cyanobacteria 
they are performing photosynthesis and then providing uh, sugars, which are then used for energy. Okay. Now, um, there are obviously different lichens, and then there are different components. So different types of fungi can uh, participate. Usually the ascomycota, but uh, the uh, basidiomycota are also uh, possible uh, participants uh, here. And then the algae uh, can uh, vary um, and include uh, uh, not only uh, algae, which are uh, eukaryotic, um, but then also cyanobacteria, which are uh, photosynthetic uh, uh, bacteria. Um, very often lichens are, uh, have a role in uh, ecosystems because if you start off with bare rock, uh, very often you know, plant roots could never anchor there. But lichens are often the first thing to grow on bare rock. And then as a result, um, it, uh, it collects uh, little particles uh, of, you know, of soil, of sediment, et cetera. And now you see here now uh, there's moss growing. So while the bare rock might only have lichens, um, including uh, reindeer lichen and the lighter gray uh, lichen there, um, then you can get mosses. And then as mosses accumulate more soil, then maybe plant roots of small plants and then ultimately trees. So lichens are often referred to as a pioneer uh, organisms uh, which are important in establishing uh, the soil necessary for larger communities. So fungi represent a kingdom of organisms which is quite diverse and has uh, many uh, diverse relationships with plants and animals and great economic value um, uh, to humans as well. So this was a review of my playlist on fungi.